I'd like to thank the committee of the Joyce Rothschild uh, Book Committee for honorable mention for my book, Neo-Abolitionism. And I was asked to prepare a few words to describe the content of the book. So I prepared some slides that will help me to make the points. The first point is I assume that the people that are gathered together there at the Beister Conference are all consider employee ownership a good thing, but what is the alternative? What is the opposite bad thing? And uh, that is the employment system where the enterprise is based on a division between the employees and the employer represented by management, the employment system. So the book is not about employee ownership as a good thing, it's about the employment system as a bad thing. <clears throat> So let's first take a look at just the employment system itself. It's based on a voluntary contract and the employer uh, employs, hires or rents the employee. Now to say rents is sort of jarring at first because we, in American English, we think of you hire a person, but you rent a car. But if you go to England, the, the, the rental cars are called hire cars because hire and rent are the same thing abstractly. Of course, the, de the details are different in both cases, but abstractly, each case is where you're buying the services of some entity, a person or a car for a specified time period, and, and uh, you're not buying the car or buying the person itself. So that explains the subtitle of the book that starts with the notion of human rentals. That's the way that you can characterize the employment system. And that immediately uh, recalls the older system where workers were involuntarily owned instead of voluntarily rented. So how do you, so since the employment system is based on a voluntary contract, and since the book calls for the abolition of that system, how do you abolish a voluntary contract, what can be the grounds to do that? And it is apparently little known that when slavery was abolished, involuntary slavery, it was also uh, the voluntary contract for lifetime servitude was also abolished. And uh, this is taken note of by the preeminent Nobel Prize winning neoclassical economist, Paul Samuelson, so since the abolition of slavery, it has been illegal to treat human earning power like other capital assets. In other words, you can not you can buy a capital asset, but you can't buy a human being uh, in terms of all the labor services they might perform over a lifetime. You are not free to sell yourself. You must rent yourself at a wage. So that's uh, the way in which the employment contract is described, in, abstractly described in the economics literature. So that's one voluntary contract that is abolished. Uh, another voluntary contract that historical contract that is also abolished today is the uh, coverture marriage contract. So this was the old marriage contract where the, the woman, the wife uh, became legally a minor no matter how old she was and, and uh, could not make contracts, could not own property in her own name and, and uh, was under the guardianship of the husband. And that contract is also abolished today. It, it was abolished in the, in the um, Married Woman's Property Acts of the late 19th and early 20th century. And I should say abolished in the democratic countries. It's still uh, the standard form in the Middle East and, and uh, other countries, some other countries. So uh, that's another example of a contract is abolished, even though we still have the residue in the standard marriage ceremony, where the old theory in, under coverture was that the woman passed from the cover, the coverture of the father to the cover of the husband and took on the husband's name. And that still is part of the marriage ceremony today where the father so-called gives away the bride uh, to the husband and the bride may take on the husband's family name. So those are the residues, as it were, 
at the ceremonial level of that old contract, which is, however, uh, now abolished. And finally, in a democratic country, uh, it is forbidden to uh, be able to sell uh, people's, uh, for people cannot sell all together or singularly their citizenship rights. And, and uh, so you have three uh, historical contracts, all, all of which were available at some time historically and, and uh, have now been abolished. So the strategy of the book, the arguments are in the book, is to go back and dig up the historical arguments against those contracts that are already abolished. And once you understand those arguments, then you, you see that they also apply against the human rental contract. So one part of the book resurrects this, the, the old forgot, largely forgotten theory uh, behind the notion of inalienable rights that was applied against the voluntary slavery contract and the coverture contract. And once you understand that notion uh, in, in modern terms, you'll see it also applies against uh, people renting themselves out. And the argument is fairly simple that all those contracts try to legally alienate certain aspects of personhood, but a person does not turn themselves into a non-person. Uh, a woman does not turn herself into a minor and a, a, a worker does not turn himself into a part-time uh, robot uh, during the life of the contract. So it, it is a contract that legally does one thing, whereas in fact, that's impossible. And thus the contract uh, treats as alienable what should be treated as in, in, inalienable. The second track in the book is the old idea that people should have a natural right to the positive and negative fruits of their labor. This is the, the, the traditional and uh, argument and legitimation for the notion of private property. And so the employment system far from uh, being based on private property is in fact violates the very notion of the appropriation of the fruits of your labor uh, by the people in the firm. And the third uh, track in the book is a history of democratic theory. And, and, and that, the notion of a democracy is not government based on the consent of the governed, because throughout uh, history from ancient times, uh, non-democratic governments or autocracies have allegedly been based upon a social contract of alienation, where, where the people give up their rights of self-governance to the king or to the uh, sovereign. And, and uh, so that it was always based in, in the more sophisticated arguments on the voluntary contract of alienation. And the rise of democratic theory says, well, for the reasons concerning inalienable rights to self-governance, that contract is also invalid. And the only valid contract uh, of governance is one of delegation, not alienation. So where the, the citizens delegate the governance rights to the, uh, those who govern, uh, and and they, so the those who govern are their representatives, or their agents, or their delegates. And when you then take a look at the employment contract, you see immediately that the management, the employer, is not are not the delegates, not the representatives of the employees. So the employment contract is again a, a contract of alienation that is abolished in the in the sphere of governance, and it so it's the pact of subjection in the workplace. So the history of democratic theory also weighs in against this private version of the pact of subjection whereby people alienate their right to self-governance within the, within the confines of, of the employment. So those are the main arguments in the book. And the title neo-abolitionism is obviously uh, referring back to the abolitionist tradition where the system of owning workers involuntarily or voluntary uh, was abolished and uh, the neo applies now to the abolition of the idea that people can be rented and, and, and uh, to abolish that contract as well. The alternative system is where the people working in a firm are the members of the firm or, or as commonly said, 
the owners of the firm and the firm should be organized as a workplace democracy where the governors are their agents, their delegates, their representatives, and, and uh, unlike the system we have today, by and large, where the employer is hardly the delegate or representative of those who are managed. So that's the, that's the uh, trajectory of argument in the book, and, and, and that's the conclusion. The book is available in most college libraries because it's a Springer uh, nature book, but uh, it's also now available on hacker book sites uh, for free. And I recommend this one, www.memorytheworld.org, where memory of the world is all one word. So I'd like to thank again, the Joyce Rothschild Book Committee for the honorable mention of my book. And these are a few words to describe the content of the book. Thank you.